I'm Peter Tudor. I'm uh, Director of Park Operations for Queen Elizabeth Lincoln Park, working for LLVC, the London Legacy Development Corporation, which is entrusted with looking after this park and the legacy after the Games of 2012. And of course, this year we're celebrating our 10th anniversary, and many of you in the room have very much been part of that in those 10 years. Um, there's a lot to talk about this afternoon. Uh, if you have been on the park, you will have seen, hopefully, some of these around the place, which are the nine trail points that each have an interesting video or augmented reality piece around them. And we're going to talk about that a little bit, but also we're going to talk about the project and how it came to be. So I'm going to let each of the panel introduce themselves. Uh, there'll be a chance for questions at the end. We are recording the session today, um, so uh, it will go up on the Living Maps website. Uh, but first of all, uh, let's introduce everybody. So, Phil, over to you. Okay. I'm, uh, oh, well, I'm Phil Cohen, Research Director of Living Maps. I'm Toby Butler from uh, Birkbeck. I'm uh, Atif Ghani from Hyperactive Developments and Heritage 5G. I'm Jonathan Gardner, I'm from Edinburgh College of Arts, University of Edinburgh. Great, thank you. Sure. I think we okay. start. Yes, right. Well, as Peter uh, said, uh, this project has been a <clears throat> long time in the making. So I thought it might be um, useful just to tell you some of the, the backstory of the project itself um, and how it's evolved over, over actually a 10 year period um, to take the form it has today. So I'm going to tell you a bit of the backstory of the project and how that's influenced the backstory of the Olympic Park site that we've tried to tell. Um, so the, the germ of the idea um, came from um, a book I wrote about um, the impact of London 2012 on its immediate host communities in East London. And uh, what I tried to do in the book was um, show how East London Londoners were responding to the advent of Olympics on their website, on their, not on their website, that's a four isn't it, uh, on their doorstep, um, in terms of what had been happening in East London over a much longer period, uh, in fact from 1960s and closures of the docks and how they'd made sense of all the changes um, that that entailed. So when I was, I was working on the, on the book, um, I had the good fortune to meet uh, Toby. Uh, I was working at the University of East London and uh, we got some money to um, make a trail around the Royal Docks and uh, Toby came to UEL to deliver that and, and he was, and as he'll tell you, he was very interested in collective memory scapes. Um, and I think our first idea for this project was very much focusing on the industrial heritage of the site. Um, so that was about 2013, 2014. Uh, so the initial version of it was going to be an audio trail, uh, drawing partly on the workplace of ethnography. I, I was able to get on the Olympic uh, Park site during the dig, design and demolish phase of it. And I did a lot of um, interviews and, and other work with the tunnelers and the, and the site and the, um, the construction workers on the site. So we started with that and then we thought, well, we'd go back and then we'd look at the, um, the industrial uh, heritage uh, and the labor history. Um, so that was the initial version of it. And I'm very grateful that, uh, that Toby stayed on board and uh, has taken us through all these uh, steps, as I'll, I'll show you, as it's evolved and has uh, had a major role in putting together the online guide uh, which um, is online, but you can also get hard copies of it there uh, afterwards on the bookstore if, if, if you're interested. Um, so that was our initial kind of starting point. Uh, and then we came across the, the work of Juliet Davis, um, who's a, a landscape uh, analyst, landscape historian. Um, and she'd um, done this rather very interesting re research into the factories, workshops, um, and small businesses that were already on were on the site, and of course were being uh, displaced and dispersed um, to make way for the Olympic Park. And she did this or work. Uh, there's a copy of her book that you can look at at the back there. Uh, and, and I think what we learned from that was how important it was to have a visual element to the story um, we wanted to tell. Uh, then, by another stroke of good fortune. Um, we, we, we came across Johnny Gardner in a talk that he gave, um, uh, and he'd been actually, as he'll tell you, had been involved in the archaeological dig on the site. Um, and uh, what, what impressed us uh, in listening to what he, him, him giving an account of that was 
first of all, that his sense of the history of the site went way back beyond uh, the Industrial Revolution, way back down to, back to, to the Bronze Age. So we, we realized we had to kind of, kind of widen our scope a bit. Um, and the second thing was that he had this um, vision of archaeology. It's not just simply a sort of like digging stuff up and um, you know, putting artifacts and objects, material culture in glass cases for people to look at. He saw, and I probably say more about this, archaeology as a, as, a, as a strategy for engaging not just with the past of a site, but its present and its future. And it's that present and future dimension that uh, we've tried to build into um, the guide as, as, as it's gone along. Then one day, um, we went on a walk around the, the perimeter of, of the new Olympic Park, and with all the boards up around it, and uh, with Bob Gilbert, I think he was in the audience there. And um, uh, Bob uh, really told us the story of the area's rich fauna and flora, and how that had, um, uh, the whole ecology had both shaped and been shaped by human manufacture. So then we began to think that really um, we had to, again, shift perspective a bit. We, 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 we should move away from a totally anthropomorphic uh, perspective and begin to focus on the, the very complicated interactions between the human and non-human environment and how that makes the landscape that um, we're walking through. Um, and I think that that brings up to, uh, uh, again, the very kind of topical and future-oriented uh, issue with which we've had to grapple, which is that, you know, we're having to live in a situation where that approach, understanding the relationship between the human and the non-human, is a very urgent undertaking. There was a recent um, study which suggested that if the current trends in global heating continue unabated, then by 2050, a lot of the Queen Elizabeth Olympic Park is going to be underwater. So, um, so that, that, that gave a certain kind of urgency to our, um, our endeavours. So in all those ways, um, uh, the kind of narrative form and content um, of Groundbreaking has been complicated. Um, so we had this sort of collaboration between an urban ethnographer, an oral historian, an archaeologist, an environmentalist, a landscape analyst, all coming together working on a common project. And I think what's emerged from this collaboration is something certainly that not, none of us individually from our individually, individual perspectives could, could have uh, achieved. But I think some kind of common ground um, has emerged in terms of the kind of story we want to tell. Um, now, it seems to me, I've, I've always argued that the, the, the Olympics are, are good to think with because they raise a number of important and connected questions uh, that go beyond the Olympics themselves. So questions like who and what are cities for? Um, is it the case, as the then mayor of Newham famously put it, the Olympics coming to East London meant that everyone is a winner? Or if there are winners when a city becomes Olympified, are there also losers? Is accelerated gentrification an inevitable concomitant of this kind of mega event led regeneration? Or can it generally redistribute people's life chances? So like many of those questions, of course, have been accentuated by the impact of COVID and the pandemic and the much more visible spatial inequalities in public health, social immunity, and working conditions. But they've also been the subject of a, a, the, the Olympic legacy and, and, and actually what it has delivered, been the subject of a lot of academic research and debate over the last 10 years. Some of the results of which you will see in the, the bookstore at the back. So there's a number of books there that um, um, uh, various members of the, of the team have been involved in putting together. So, what we did, we wanted to challenge um, a kind of one-dimensional reading of the site's history. That um, uh, you know, that basically you have often this rather triumphalist narrative of um, uh, a link to kind of notions of civic boosterism, um, in which everything is getting better and better. Um, you have this; uh, it's a kind of a triumphalism, really. Uh, and what it means is that a lot of the wrinkles in history, a lot of the um, inconvenient truths are kind of airbrushed out and you get this kind of glowing picture of progress and prosperity onwards and upwards and so on. And I think there is a sense in which some of the Olympic discourse does sort of buy into that. Um, and so we wanted to challenge that rather simple view of, uh, of progress and present a more complicated and interesting account, and one that focuses on the discontinuities as well as the continuities. 
So groundbreakers came to vote for us, not just the environmental cost of fossil fuel capitalism and smokestack industry, but the qualitative step change in East London's social structure brought about by the transformation of, Tra of Stratford and its environment into a hub of the global digital economy. So in a moment, um, my colleagues are going to unpack some of the, the more concrete, substantive issues of method and interpretation which that approach uh, entailed. But I'll just end by explaining just why it's taken us so long, 10 years, um, to deliver this project. Um, so initially, in the immediate uh, afterpath of, of, of 2012, I think it's fair to say the official sense of the site's heritage was limited to that of the Olympics itself. You know, everything that happened here before 2012 uh, just didn't uh, register, just as the material traces of that history had more or less been, been erased. Um, now, in fact, um, I mean, thanks to the, actually the foresight of, um, of, uh, of Lowcock, um, there are a number of uh, poem installations dotted around the park. I think some of you may, may know them. Uh, actually, I did a study once when I spent a, a day in the park watching how many people noticed these poems that are engraved on these kind of wooden uh, almost nobody, unless their dog happened to kind of go there. <laughs> so, for example, there is um, there's some wonderful poems. There's a there's a wonderful poem by Lem Cisse uh, called Spark Catchers, which is about the Match Girl strike. Uh, Joe Shapcott's uh, Wild Swimmer is about the lost and undergrounded rivers that uh, go across the park. Caroline Duffy's poem about Ethan Manor, his mission to t turn East End boys into model citizens as well as sporting champions. Um, so we've been careful to give these existing nods to the past uh, a high profile in our online guide. Um, so, you know, it wasn't a complete tabula rasa, there, there was stuff there, but what we're trying to do is to build that into a much wider and, and longer duration uh, account of the, um, of the site's uh, history. Um, however, I think it has to be said that uh, until the arrival of, of Peter here, to, to join the energy management team. It's the only thing that changed the official attitude of indifference, actually, because he, I think he, he saw that actually a, a, a trail and a guide like this could actually enrich the visitors' experience. You know, it, so they come here because it's the Olympic Park, but they might also be interested in what was here before. So, um, so when Peter arrived, so anyway, it was a bit like walking through an open door after all this quite a long period of, you know, having doors sort of shut in our face. So anyway, so that's how we managed to get, get going. So we've had these, uh, had these early serendipities of meeting various people who come into the, the project. But in fact, things didn't go smoothly. The initial grant from the Heritage Lottery Fund uh, was held by the University of East London, where I worked. Um, but his senior management decided in their wisdom that the successful heritage course which Toby was running was surplus to requirements, which meant that he was out of a job and we were out of an institutional home. So what we then did was we shifted the whole grant to a community organisation which we worked with before. Um, but unfortunately, um, uh, this organisation went belly up. I mean, partly perhaps to the impact of austerity, possibly mismanagement. Anyway, it went belly up and that was, you know, that was that. Um, so by 2018, that's five years after, yeah, we got the original idea, we were almost back to square one. And we were on the point of giving up when we were approached by Atif Ghani, uh, who had his own vision for what, uh, what a heritage trail uh, or heritage story uh, might look like. Um, and obviously we met up and, we, you know, we sort of hit it off, we decided to combine forces. So what? So the Division of Labour has been that Living Maps, the Living Maps team concentrated on producing the online guide, and Atif and his team, I think tell you a bit about it, have been doing the, the immersive trail uh, with these heritage hotspots. So it's been a bit of a bumpy ride to get here, and there were times, I must say, when I was not quite sure I would live long enough to see it all happen. <laughs> Fortunately, you know, touch wood or whatever, you know, it, it has. Um, now, in a way, it's tempting to pat ourselves on the back and, um, you know, another triumph over adversity story. Uh, and we do live in a very bipolar culture, in which we continually oscillate between properties of doom and new dawn. Every cenotaph has to be followed by a jubilee. Uh, we've done our best to avoid that temptation in the story uh, we've told. We've tried to remain grounded in the material evidence, 
We've tried to avoid being nostalgic about the good old bad old days of industrialism and for the advent of some once and future green and pleasant land which will magically rescue us from the consequences of our inactions over global climate change. So we try to kind of steer a course between those, those kind of extremes. And just to, as a concluding thought, there's a similar tension at, at the heart of the Olympic dream because it's kind of split. One level you have a rather utopian vision of a world in which ethnic divisions and wars are kind of superseded by the peaceful competition of young people from nations across the world. It, it's an inspiring vision. Um, and yet, uh, it, the actual uh, motto of the um, Olympics, probably know, I'm going to do a bit of Latin here in case Boris Johnson's in the room. Uh, <laughs> Citius, altius, fortius, faster, higher, stronger. Well, that's great if it's applied to the sports field, um, but if it's applied to models of economic growth, there are it's a recipe for intensified social divisions and environmental disaster. So at the very least, we have to do our utmost to ensure that those entrusted with the Olympic legacy don't use it to achieve un unsustainable growth. I think it's a, a measure of the achievement of the park's present custodians that they have done their very best to rise to this challenge over the past decade, despite operat operating in, in very difficult conditions. I mean, you've only got to compare uh, Olympic Park with, uh, say, uh, Sydney or Rio or Athens to, to see what I mean, right? So it's made a good list of it. So I think that this outcome is a just cause for modest celebration, and Living Maps is proud to be able to make a small contribution to that endeavour. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. I'll just tell you a bit more about that. Right, hard to follow. Well, thank, thank you, that's great. Um, so I, I, I have a small kind of bit part in writing some of the content for the trail, but also um, my main role really at was, uh, I think, kind of project managing, particularly the, the online and digital um, elements um, of the website. So that's what I'm going to be talking to you about today. Well, that's a good bit to me. Um, so, one of the first struggles of constructing any kind of historical guide, as you can imagine, particularly one that's going to go all the way back to the Bronze Age, plus deal with environmental, kind of, you know, natural, all of this kind of stuff, how on earth do you kind of make that digestible and understandable to a casual park visitor? So, you know, this is, this is the, the huge challenge of any public historian who's trying to kind of tell some sort of narrative um, about a place. Um, so in publishing, you know, if it, was a, if, it was, if it was just a printed guide book, the classic thing you'd do is, is work through some themes. You'd do it by period or do it by theme. You'd have different chapters on a theme, and, and um, in some respects we did kind of run with that, but there is a problem when you're applying um, a lot of historical information to a map or to a site where it can get really quite overwhelming. And the other problem that you have with a park, uh, particularly the Olympic Park, is that there, there are many, many ways in and many ways out, and so you can't quite predict you know, which order um, uh, a, a guest coming to the park is going to move through that space and move through that material. So whatever it, ha whatever it was, it was going to work on a mobile phone or whatever, you know, it had to be uh, possible to kind of dip into it in, in, in different ways. Um, so let's just kind of just thinking about maps themselves. Um, Probably kind of one of the one of the, the, the best uh, examples of, of kind of citizen mapping is history pin, which I'm sure uh, many of you uh, will have come across. Um, it's extremely well funded and supported. It's um, based uh, at the Institute of, of Historical Research. Uh, the, the, the elements of it, and, it, and it's just a space where you know if you've got a, if you've got a, a trail to do or, or some kind of place based uh, pictures or information, you know, for free, you can, you can place it on there. One of, the, one of the issues that you have with, with citizen-based mapping like this is that it can get pretty overwhelming pretty quickly. If you've got lots of themes and lots and lots of kind of pins on a map, it actually gets quite hard to move through. And often you'll find that people's um, dwelling time uh, on sites like this um, actually is, is fairly low. So, so we felt that you know, we had to kind of keep this uh, organised um, um, and sort of doable, really. And so we were looking for a, um, a new platform that perhaps could cope with uh, with some depth of text and depth of material um, but also could present it on a map uh, in, a, in a in a kind of readable way and that's that's quite a difficult challenge I mean, if you think about most Google Maps with with pins you know, often you could put an image on there maybe one paragraph but it, it's quite hard to find something that will work um, with you know with, with more text than that and we did want to go a little bit deeper um, so we came across this wonderful platform called story map and uh, story map um, it's a free platform developed by Northwestern University in, in the United States. 
And we came across it because it was being used by Liverpool museums for various place-based projects around slavery. Um, and story maps can crucially in, uh, accommodate introductory material, so it's not all place-based. You can actually have kind of like a general bit of text uh, at the beginning of something to introduce a theme, which is very useful. Uh, and also have the flexibility to be explored, both by clicking on map icons, uh, like Google Maps, but also you could you could run it in a, in a, in a narrative order by using arrows left and right where you can actually kind of run through which means that you could actually uh, give it some sort of structure um, so that was a, a really good solution for us um, so in, in the past there was a tendency for some local historians to envisage places as very fixed things bordered and defined with specific somehow intrinsic character that emerges over time and recently work by historic and cultural geographers has challenged this conception to argue that places are subject to all kinds of flows and trajectories and shifting patterns of nature and power and culture and capital, which make for a more complex and sometimes more difficult history. And it's hard to think of a more dramatic example of these geographies playing out in a short space of time than um, what even recent ancestors would have recognised as marshlands here, um, you know, until re relatively recently. So as Phil said, the Olympic Park is such a great case study for this. Um, so with this in mind, our guide traces four major currents of change. Uh, the first one, fluid histories, traces the entangled flows um, of uh, people, goods, water, power, like electricity, and waste that have shaped the landscape. So here we trace the possible locations of a Roman river crossing that must have been here. We consider the crucial role of the waterways for the industrial and natural history of the area. And we learn something of the culture of the tunnellers, who recently physically and for us metaphorically burrowed underneath the surface of the rapidly transforming site of the Olympic Games. Encampments and other dwellings looks at human habitation and homemaking. So we go from the remains of the Iron and Bronze Age villages uh, discovered within sight of this building um, through to uh, prisoner of war camps, gypsy campsites and social housing um, projects like Clays Lane Housing Cooperative and also the, uh, the allotments um, which, which, which themselves had lots of interesting structures and shacks uh, uh, made on them. Um, so here we touch uh, um, on you know a kind of range of themes here you know from the military uh, going back to the First World War where the first prisoner of, of, of war camps um, were but also all the way through to the Cold War and um, as we'll be hearing from, from Johnny uh, in a second there's some really fascinating um, civil defence ruined villages that were kind of purposely uh, constructed for training on the site um, for for training people in the event of nuclear attack in the 1950s and 1960s. And let me look at edge lands. Um, and this looks at many ways of the site and its inhabitants, both human and non-human, have been transformed as this site's been excavated and engineered and polluted and demolished and rebuilt. Here we consider as the Olympic opening ceremony so dramatically portrayed, how commons used for grazing gave way to the Victorian megastructures on the site, like the Stratford Works and the Clarnico Sweet Factory, some of the biggest industrial complexes of their age. But we also consider, consider lesser known changes, the legacy of pollution, managing flooding, dealing with human waste and the tra trajectory of biodiversity. And we also consider the conceptual history of the site as a borderland by policymakers, dealing with everything from sewage to industrial zoning to post-war road planning. And our last theme is level playing fields. This examines changing patterns of local labour and leisure in the 19th and 20th centuries as communities struggle to improve their conditions of life, including through sports and leisure activities. So on the labour front, we encounter some of the industrial disputes of national significance. The Match Girls strike, hugely influential on the formation of trade unions. The Pentonville Five, imprisoned for striking at Chobham Farm Container Depot, which in turn led to several industries and all major ports in the UK being shut down in 1972. Of course, the theme of leisure can't be ignored. From this astonishingly successful Eaton uh, Manor Boys Club, set up to help the poor by philanthropists from Eaton School, as well as establishing a boathouse for rowing, which is still visible from the park border, they built a sports centre which included the acquisition of the Cinder Running Track from the Wembley Stadium used in the 1948 Olympics, relayed here. And of course we couldn't leave out Hackney Stadium, where motorbike speedway attracted massive crowds and greyhound racing was broadcast every week to betting shops on a Saturday afternoon all over the country. As well as, the, the, as well as this dynamic map, I should also add that we've produced a PDF guide, which Phil mentioned, which you know, we've got a printed copy here, but anyone, of course, can print it at home or read it um, on, on a screen very comfortably for those who prefer a more traditional uh, book format. Um, 
and also the PDF guide gives scope for much larger images. And the, the images, you know, are a really important part of this guide. And you know, we're extremely grateful to the libraries and archives and private individuals who give us permission to uh, reproduce them. And finally, I'd like to draw your attention to some teaching materials, which range at 11 to 14 year olds, key stage three, um, as the park is a, is a very popular destination for field trips. We commissioned an experienced local teacher and field trip guide, Neil Larkin, from Urban Geography East London, to devise two lesson uh, and activity plans designed for school groups, each of which could be carried out comfortably in a half a day. Um, they're aligned to Key Stage 3 National Curriculum for Geography, and they use contemporary and historical sites as case studies. The first one, Risk and Resilience, uh, looks at um, the park site from the, the perspective of managing risk to Londoners from various threats, including flooding, disease, bombing, global warming and nuclear war. The group visit four sites in the park where pupils will evaluate and debate risks and resilience and in the process create their own top chance game, of which you can see three example cards here. The second trail uh, looks at contrasting sites, the aquatic centre, the site of the uh, Bronze and Iron Age village and the remains of the Clarnico Sweet Factory to consider the historical geographies of human impact on the environment. Um, and the notes and short videos and worksheets are free. They've been designed to be easily printed uh, onto A4 uh, for schools or youth groups to print out and use. Over the years, as the Olympics happened, I was also in favor of the change. And at the time I'd gotten married, so that was sort of 2005. Um, and one of the first immediate surprises for me was actually that the fact that the, the park went into this kind of lockdown and that for those of us residents who really enjoyed it actually weren't able to enjoy it for a while it really we had to sacrifice quite a bit and that was a a, a, a source of, of conflict and yet as we as it developed and as things evolved i found um i got to enjoy the park um both westfield and the amenities that it offered and and in that time i i sort of developed a family and had uh, two young children um, and in the midst of that, um, I'd been making films and making projects, but it was really thinking about my children um, that made me sort of stop and, and, and have a think. And by that, I mean, uh, my children really didn't understand that there was any history in this space prior to the Olympics, um, you know, as, as was sort of echoed earlier. And that struck me, considering um, I was oh, had been such a fan of of things like the Cathedral of of Sewage and, and you know the various canals and what they were doing at the abandoned Carpenter's Lock and thinking, what was this all about, you know, and and really wanting to dig know more um, and knowing that there was more. Um, so out of that, I began my own personal journey. Um, at, where uh, well, I began my own personal journey at that time, which was uh, in, in experimenting through the use of immersive technologies. So by immersive technologies, I'm sort of thinking about virtual reality, or augmented reality, mixed reality, sort of metaverse, so sort of digital twins, digital reproductions of, of objects, stories, elements that could then be placed in situ or could be viewed in a headset remotely um, that would then transport you to a space or to tell a story in a space using a piece of technology which would enable a kind of furthering of that sort of uh, environment and, and that space. Um, at that time, I, I met the great Ralph, uh, Ralph Ward, the Rafe Ward who's, who's joined us, who, who had uh, introduced me to, to Toby and Phil, and I'd heard about um, the disappointment that they'd run into, and. And at the time, Rafe, myself, and Dr. Jim Clifford, uh, he's the author of a book called The uh, History of the Lower Lee Valley, uh, The Industrial History of the Lower Lee Valley, uh, West Ham and the Lower Lee Valley, uh, which at the time I, I really used as a great resource for the history of this sort of specifically the Victorian and Edwardian period of uh, the industrial history of the park uh, and the Lower Lee Valley. But we had been experimenting with some sort of basic ideas around heritage and history content and then on meeting phil and toby we were, i was very taken and i i not only felt for them and, and what they were trying to do in terms of their project their kind of radical and disruptive spirit but also the desire to leave a different type of legacy uh, and to remind people of the plurality that exists in a space and particularly a space that's 
as rich as the Olympic Park. So out of that, I think it was in March 2020, but it all becomes a bit of a blur. We uh, collectively, uh, Living Maps and, uh, and uh, Hyperactive applied for a, a small award with the Foundation of Future London and were successful. And out of that, we began a journey. As part of that grant, we, and, and we have always been interested in working with young people. And again, going back personally, for me, it was about my daughters and thinking about them and their generation, but also this wanting to instill a sense of young people born in East London, feeling a sense of ownership um, for the histories that are around them. Um, and for many of them who would have passed the Abbey Mills pumping station many, many a time on the way to school or on the way to Abbey Mills Park or wherever it may be, they would have no clue or no sense of what that history and what it was about and that it's a part of their history. So that was always very, very important to me. So out of the small grant, we actually began working with uh, Newham Youth Empowerment to actually develop the content um, as well as the technology the, the delivery technology, so the ways that we'd want to tell the story. Um, I know, and maybe a lot of you are aware, the, the spectacle of new technology is often a way to really increase engagement. And I thought it would be nice to trick people by using that technology as a way to think about local history and think about things that are around them, to be able to step back into time. Um, I mean, I've always been a little frustrated that museums often play this sort of very central role in the writing of history where one has to go to a museum. I always feel that one should be in, we should be in a time now where content and assets should be in a way available to us, at least for reference, when we are in situ. And that was sort of the beginning of the spirit of stuff. So out of uh, and over the midst of COVID uh, and, and the various lockdowns, um, with a group of six young learners from New Youth Empowerment, as well as a couple of young developers, uh, master students from Teesside University, we began, we began this process of developing um, what became the uh, Augmented Reality Heritage Trail. Um, I mean, in some ways, COVID managed to accelerate the mass use of, of QR codes, which is nice. Everybody sort of feels quite comfortable. Um, along the way, we did learn quite a few things, like people don't like to download apps, including me. And again, uh, we worked on this. Finding these little solutions um, was, was important to us. Um, we also discovered that things don't often work on all platforms. People often, you know, end up being a Mac or, P, you know, these little, the, and, and we were determined to find a way to make sure our content was as accessible as possible, rather than exclusive. Uh, accessibility was always the, kind of the first steps about what we were trying to do. Yeah, dotted around the Olympic Park are nine of these story points. Um, and really, all, all one needs to do is open up their, use their phone, open up the camera, and focus on the QR code and click the web address. And from there, a kind of Zapper app launches, and you launch that. And then what we've got here is the uh, Olympic Bell story. And you click Launch Launch, and it takes the you. Olympic Bell was cast specifically for the 2012 Games and was run by gold medalist Clarity And it takes you directly to the story point. In this particular story point, we've got it as a video, a YouTube video. Um, and and but others are 3D 3D graphics and others are maps 3D maps um, and yeah I think it's there each of the each of these story points are about one one and a half minutes long and yeah we're hopeful that uh, people will enjoy. Um, so yes, I'm Jonathan Gardner. I'm an archaeologist and heritage researcher. I'm now based at Edinburgh College of Art, uh, strangely, but I was at the UCL Institute of Archaeology um, until very recently, and indeed that's how I uh, encountered Phil, first of all, when I was phoned up on a building site digging some things in the city, and it had this rather mad idea. Um, but yes, so I, my, I guess my role has been a kind of archaeological consultant 
whereas perhaps Juliet has been the kind of historical and, and social geographer role. But we've, is, I should really name drop her as, as Phil did, because she's been so crucial to talking about the past of this site more recently, whereas perhaps I've been looking at the, the slightly deeper past, but also the processes of constructing the park itself. Um, and, and as you may or may not know, there was a huge amount of archaeological work here done uh, between 2007 and 2008 in the, I'm going to get this wrong, dig, demolish, design phase, I think that's the right order, um, of, of the park's construction um, by various companies, mainly MOLAS, Museum of London Archaeology Service, now MOLA, and PCA, Pre-Construct Archaeology, of, of which there are some, I'm sorry, some MOLA people here today, and written up ultimately by Wessex Archaeology and a publication in 2012. So quite a lot of archaeological work done, publication came out in 2012, but not so much has happened since. And I think it was important to me uh, as a researcher and as an archeologist of this site and other so-called mega event sites around London, um, that these slightly older histories came to the fore too. Um, this is, so to begin with, I'm gonna basically in this last talk, uh, go through a few hot spots or points in the park. And I'm gonna start with one that isn't really one location, but actually you could say over 120. We, we put the pin on the aquatic center because that's probably the most spectacular site. But yes, in, in, in this archaeological program in 2007-2008, almost 100 archaeologists uh, dug about 122 small trenches and about eight larger ones all over the site. Um, this one at the top here is uh, actually just up the road, less than sort of 50, 100 metres away by the velodrome, um, or maybe a little bit further than 100 metres. But um, So I kind of came into this in 2007, so actually before the Groundbreakers was a thing. I was a, an archaeologist, fresh-faced 21-year-old out of university, out of an undergraduate, I needed to pay the rent, and I ended up here for my sins. Um, it was a very different place, along with Vaisal, who sat at the back there, was one of the people I met here uh, on the site. And I later then, um, it was an eye-opener, but I later then kind of got more interested in this idea of heritage, how the past is used or abused in the present, and I came to write my PhD, as I say, about the history of London's mega events, um, which I'll come on to later on. And and I, I also was slightly troubled, I think, as an archaeologist, we were digging up the ancient past on the site in 2007, 2008, but very often we'd be in the back garden, well, the backyard of industrial firms, mm -hmm. which had only seemingly just left, and their buildings were sort of half demolished. And I, I started to question this idea, of, oh, it was an industrial wasteland, was that really so true? So I, I also got this interest in a more recent history, I suppose. Um, so, in this kind of project, archaeologists were brought in um, basically to mitigate damage to the past, to excavate sites before they're uh, destroyed forever, and that's part of the planning process. That's the, the Olympic Delivery Authority in London uh, Development Agency uh, at the time uh, kind of brought us in, um, and as I, I was just very lowly in this, I should say, I wasn't running any of the projects, I was just a digger. Um, so I'm going to go through kind of what it was like being an archaeologist there, how that's now fed into groundbreakers and a few of our archaeological discoveries. So the idea behind this was to kind of tell part of the hidden history of, of the archaeological workers on the site, just like Phil's hotspot tells the, the hidden story of the tunnelers and the construction workers on the site to some extent. So um, there's almost sort of 10,000 years of, of history on the site, actually before the Bronze Age, but we say the Bronze Age because it's probably the best example, but... Uh, really, uh, artifacts from, from all periods of, of human inhabitation of this part of uh, the UK. Um, some kind of classic finds here. So, sorry, that's a, a closer image of the Temple Mills excavation. So, today the velodrome is immediately to the right of this, and, and the head house of the tunnels um, uh, is, is immediately to the left. So, this is sort of 10 metres down below what was called the West Ham Tip, a, a municipal landfill site. And uh, buried under tons and tons of rubbish was a Victorian street, which in turn was built. And you can just about see it's a bit bright. Uh, there's, there's obviously the uh, I should get that to work. Um, the the road there, which is from the Victorian period, cobbled streets. And indeed, this is a pavement up the side of it with with kind of house fronts there. And actually, this where the archaeologists are standing is the Tumbling Bay um, stream. Which, uh, the, after which the play park is named just outside of this cafe. So some of those features have, have made it, um, and, and this was the largest excavation. Um, here's some of our archaeological colleagues, thanks to my anonymous informants for sending me these. We weren't really meant to take pictures at the time, but we did anyway. Um, so I have 
fit in them. But this was the kind of conditions we were working in. It was rubber suits, rubber boots, rubber gloves, respirators, because there were so many contaminants. And that's the flip side of industrialization. There's a very successful industry here, uh, but, but often, until recently, very poorly regulated. So things like hydrocarbons, arsenic, cyanide, or Prussian blue, um, and, uh, and indeed some radioactivity, supposedly, as well. So that, it was an interesting site. Not all of them were as bad as this, but we, you, know, you can kind of see the conditions we were working in. Um, some star finds. This is a Neolithic axe uh, found just south of Stratford High Street, actually by that man over there, Basil Pyden, who I always, I always name drop the people that found the best stuff. So they never get their names in the report, so just to embarrass him. But this is literally minutes after its discovery um, at, the, at the time, and this is, you know, this is about this big. So it's like a ritual hand axe, which seems to have been thrown in by some of the first farmers uh, in the area. We don't think they were living here. The people that were living here. Um, where on this site, the, as in the aforementioned Bronze Age, then Iron Age village, so um, something like um, probably 1500 BC for a settlement, a series of roundhouses, and then almost up to the Roman period. And in this case, these are there was four Iron Age burials, um, and indeed a strange goat burial, which we still don't really know much about. So that's that's kind of one of the kind of key sites there, and and all of these have their individual hotspots on the Groundbreakers Trail and in the booklets. So do have a look. Another exciting site, that's, uh, and, and here I am again, yours truly, uh, in a rather cold shot in December 2007. This is a late 18th century and 19th century, or early 19th century rowboat, which is now under the West Ham Football Club's hospitality suite, um, in a disused part of the, the Pudding Mill River, which itself was filled in uh, for the construction of the park. Um, so these are all kind of... Uh, you know, sort of the, the sexy archaeology, if you like, or at least the, the big star finds. This is actually on the cover of the book, and it's the one you'll, you'll see most often, I suppose. And this is actually had been a ship's boat, an ocean-going vessel's boat, you know, to sort of get to and from the ship. Um, we could tell that by the big lifting rings that were set into it. But it had been repurposed to hunt ducks on the Bobat rivers, and it was filled with buckshot and a big mount for a large, rather large gun. So all these kind of interesting stories, and that the boat was lifted and was given to Bournemouth University's maritime archaeology students, but mysteriously then went on fire, sadly, so no longer with us. But it was covered with coal tar, um, which is obviously quite flammable, so that, might, that was why it was preserved so well as well, of course. Um, so this is also right underneath Parks Galvanising, which was one of the oldest businesses on the park, uh, which had been there since almost, I think, the 1960s. Um, so that was, you know, these kind of layers of history and then, of course, now the London Stadium, um, at formerly the Olympic and Paralympic Stadium. Um, another kind of well-known site, um, again, really just out the door here, uh, down by the, the River Lee, uh, a, a series of uh, anti-aircraft gun emplacements um, established in 1938 and said to have been some of the first to shoot down Luftwaffe bombers during the war, upgraded several times. This isn't actually them. I didn't, didn't have a picture of them, but this is a very similar design from Richmond Park. And we've got yeah, more information about that on the, on the app. They even find things like uh, the tin helmets you see here and, and rifle butts and things like that. It's a really remarkable site. But I think actually less observed by the archaeologists, so, to some extent the archaeology and the buildings recording stopped around the Second World War. And that's where this rhetoric of industrial decline, industrial wasteland perhaps starts to come in. And I thought as an archaeologist, I partly want to challenge that. And, and you can see that in some of the other hot spots. And, and discussion about all the jobs that were here and, and Juliet's work. But one of the things that was less discussed about this site was after the war, it became a Cold War civil defense training village. And what that meant was, um, it's not a military operation, but the Home Office set up this organization and built a fake ruined village with 20 different kinds of buildings in various states of disrepair, sometimes incorporating real rubble from the Blitz. And, and for, for 11 years, um, or actually more than, I think of 15 years, that the, the Civil Defence Corps practised at rescuing people from these buildings with the idea that if London was bombed by an atomic and then a hydrogen bomb, they would go in and rescue people. Slightly fanciful now, but this was deadly serious. And I think they had something like 250,000 volunteers across the UK. And they built villages like this all over, but it's, it's mostly forgotten, this rather remarkable institution. And they had competitions and they had you know, different boroughs of London would, would compete. This is actually from one of those competitions in 1964. Um, and there's, there's images of that in the Metropolitan Archives, but please don't share that one because I've got limited <laughs> permissions for it. Um, 
So really quite remarkable histories that have sometimes that, you know, the limits of archaeology um, and, and deadlines and so forth were missed. So I'm glad that we could have incorporated them into, uh, into this trail now. Um, to end, though, I want to talk about something that, again, wasn't necessarily seen as archaeological. I, I put together this point, which I'm calling remnants and traces, and it's about this idea, oh, well, there's nothing of the past, materially speaking, to see in the park, is there? Other than perhaps the rivers, and uh, the river walls are kind of original. Some street names have, have obviously, we have the likes of Chobin Manor, the development near, named after Medieval Manor, or, or various other street names, Knight's Bridge, or, or, um, which I think was named after the Knights Templar of Temple Mills. So there's some, some nods and street names, but in terms of, you know, there's no ruins, there's no uh, artifacts necessarily lying around, or is there? Um, so actually less known, again, I would say, is that when they were building the park, something like 98% of all of the material, whether it be soil, whether it be demolished buildings, was recycled and is still here. So 98% of the material past, if you like, is still mm -hmm. within the boundaries of the park. Just radically sublated, you know, reimagined, whatever you want to call it, but it is still there. And most obviously with um, the landscape itself, you know, this, this is just outside again near the Olympic rings, but these landforms are, are built of millions of tons of clean soil. You may remember the washing machines that were quite famously used to do that and, and a huge an amazing effort by the engineers and the soil and the scientists and so forth to do that. And even more obviously, if you go to almost any of the bridges of the Olympic Park, you'll see this stuff, which is kind of crushed type one or whatever they call it, of, of crushed bricks, crushed stone, crushed concrete from buildings, roads, and so forth. And it's in these gabions on the, on the bridge facings. So you will see that all over the place. So it's not spectacular. Yes, it's not a Roman ruin, but it is everywhere around here. And maybe in what's slightly more playfully, of that, sorry, that's that's the entrance to the Pudding Mill River, which was filled in, and there's the, the, the back of the London Stadium there. Um, that was filled in with material excavated from the site of what was Nobbs Hill. So they reduced the hill to build the stadium and filled in the stream. So again, the, the, the past was recycled in a very tan like tangible way. Um, and again, just outside here, you have recycled granite sets or cobbles, and you have these curbs, rather nice curbs, uh, just next to the Tumbling Way playground, which I'm pretty sure came from that uh, that Temple Mills street that I showed you at the beginning. So I think it's just it's just a kind of say that it is still here. You've got to look for it, but it's 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 not spectacular. But it is fundamental to the very landscape, the terrain of the park. If you think about all those millions of tons of soil at a very basic level, which I think is is really quite interesting. Um, but I, I'm happy to, to kind of talk more about this, and there's a lot, lot more on, on the guide, so I do encourage you to click through it, and um, I'll end there. So thank you very much. A lot of information to absorb. It is 10 years since the Games, but the history of the <laughs> site is a lot, a lot more than that, as we have learned. Um, I really encourage, I, I love this stuff. You, it, it didn't take much to persuade me. Um, <laughs> All of this really interesting information in the booklet, it's on the online, you can download it. Um, and of course, as we celebrate this year, we're not just celebrating the ten, uh, summer of sport, we're celebrating all the things that the park has, has become in the, those 10 years. Um, whether it's people living, whether there was a basketball arena just next door to us here, whether it's all the kids you see out enjoying half term today. Um, one of the great celebrations is for our volunteers, and the legacy of games makers from the, from the game, but uh, some of you are with us today uh, who in, in have your own oral history project, which is, is coming to fruition and, and which will be able to feed in other stories of, of what has happened here. I don't think the full history of this park will ever be written because it isn't stopping. Mm -hmm. um, you will have seen, we opened, they opened the Ava Arena last week down at Pudding Mill, and you've seen Pudding Mill on the slides. It looks a bit different at the moment, but it will look different again because the Aber Arena is just temporary and eventually people will live there too. Uh, and where there was a water polo venue at the Games, we now have East Banks coming. And over the next few years you'll see us opening a new Sadler's Wells Theatre, the Victorian Albert Museums, a new extension, new studios for BBC, and places for University of the Arts London and University College London. So the history keeps on. Um, there's lots and lots of layers. Uh, get out there, find the QR codes. <laughs> Um, but that'll only give you nine sites until out of bits and you'll have to do all the other ones that you want to do. Uh, so get the book as well. Um, thank you very much for coming, everybody. Uh, please do talk to our colleagues here. Thank you for making this happen.
Olympic artist in residence Neville Ga Gaby said, Regeneration which wipes out or ignores the past is at best unwise. Needless to say, we agree wholeheartedly with that statement. An understanding of the past of this place can be immediately rewarding. The past we, we, we present is not always positive, it's not always celebratory. Like the present, it can be messy, contrary, and resist the tropes so often used by journalists um, and developers when characterising parts of East London. But we do hope that whoever you are, from a long-time resident to a casual visitor to the park, something in the guide will leave you a little wiser, and at the very least, lay to rest the idea that the site was little more than a blighted wasteland before the park established. Thank you.